Bob Stevens, and I'm a farmer here, here at Goodyear, peanut, peanut and grain farmer. Uh, I've been, been here for, since 1955, uh, when my father bought the place, and I've basically been here ev ev ever since. Back in those early days, it was all mi mixed farming here, but uh, yeah, th thing, things sort of changed, and then we became peanut and peanut and grain farmers. And you have good years and you have have bad years, and uh, actually, this this year would be probably one of the most harshest seasons that I, 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 I can ever remember. You know, we've had had drought years and uh, yeah, we've had some years where we've had flood too and we've had a, had a loss, but I think we planted on marginal rainfall this year and we had a very hot summer. And I had, in one particular paddock, I had peanuts that were still coming up 14 weeks after I'd, I'd planted them. And that's in March when we did have some, some good rain. That's the only good rain we've had all year. Usually the planting time for peanuts is well, I like to think it's early, early November, and some people plant a little bit earlier than that, but that's basically November is the main month for planting peanuts. Uh, this, this year we were, we, we didn't get our planting finished until just, just on Christmas, and we're sort of paying the price for it now, but that, that was because there was no rainfall. There was no rainfall, there was hardly any peanuts planted in this area here until Till just 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 prior to Christmas, and uh, anyway, that was the planting, and then uh, and then throughout the, the we used chemicals to control the broadleaf weeds. Uh, this year, I didn't have to use any because there was never enough rain to bring bring enough weeds up. So that, that was that was that was quite a saving. But then a cultivation. There's usually only one cultivation that I, I do with the peanuts in a normal year. Just one cultivation, and then uh, harvest. Harvest time starts probably usually about 20, 22 weeks after you plant them, and that that can vary by a couple of weeks depending on how the how the season goes. And then from harvesting, everything everything's in bulk now, and you harvest, and then you put them in your silos, and then you deliver them to, or have, have someone come and pick them up and del deliver them to a processor because you haven't got anything till you've got them in the bin. <laughs> so they might be out there and they might look all right, what, whatever, but you still haven't got them till they're in the bin. I, I rotate all the time with my peanuts. I rotate with corn. Some, some years when the price is right, I'll use sorghum, but I find corn and peanuts is a suitable rotation here. I, I found it very satisfactory. But probably the, the most worrying challenge that I that I, I, I've ever faced, apart from apart from droughts, droughts and high interest rates, they, they were they, they were a real challenge to us in the 80s and the early early 90s, and actually drove quite a lot of farmers to the wall. And it was it was a, was certainly a worry to me, and I know it was a worry to other farmers around us. You know, as we, we were paying up to 22% interest on machinery and overdraft rates were. I can't remember, 15, 16%, something like that. And uh, yeah, there, was, there wasn't a lot of f future. I, I, some of my mates at that time left the industry and I, I wasn't far off, far off going either. You know, I could, I could see we just, we just weren't going anywhere here. And then the next biggest challenge, I think, was sclerotinia that came along in 91. Uh, it was a big issue throughout the whole area in 91. And uh, then anyway, we've battled on. There's been no real suitable chemicals, and that's probably when I've started trialling natrimin. And I've gone on to use natrimin. I found it successful, and today that's the only fertiliser I use on my on my peanuts. And yeah, I've, I've been quite happy with it, even though I've had a little bit of sclerotinia this year in a couple of patches. But I think that could even be due to the harshness of the season, might have contributed to it, but, uh, yeah, but it's still, still it's a worrying concern, you'd rather not see it than see it. And uh, apart from that, the whole industry, oh, right back to the 80s, I can look back to the early 80s, the, the trouble that we've had in the industry, uh, you know, been sending my peanuts to outside operators rather than through the pe peanut company was the peanut board back then 
and that, that was a challenge that's cost the industry money because we argued with each other, we didn't know where we were going and then, uh, then we've had aflatoxin, aflatoxin became a big problem in those dry years in the 80s and uh, yeah, it cost, cost some growers a terrible amount of money. Aflatoxin, then, then there was salmonella in the industry that came through at the peanut company of Australia, they got salmonella, it affected the whole industry and uh, sometimes I even look back and we think why are we still in this industry when you see the problems that it's had and the, the money that it's cost the whole industry. You know, be, you, I don't think you could put a price on it, be, be millions, be millions. So, but anyway, some of us have battled on it. We, know, we don't know anything else, so we stop with what we know. <laughs> I find it's always nice to make money, but it's more satisfying to have a good quality crop to sell and, and have someone recognise it, that you've got a quality crop. Yeah, you know, that probably gives you, will, will give you the equal satisfaction of what a, what a good paycheck will give you, you know, just, just to have that. You know you've, you've done as well as you can and have people recognise and they appreciate the product that you produce. It's, it's, it's just changing, yeah, from all, all man, manual labour, pulling the peanuts by hand, chipping, chipping the peanuts with a hoe, with no, no chemicals. But back in the, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, there was, was no chemicals to do all that. It was all, all done by hand. And then we started probably in the late 60s, the early 70s when we started using herbicides, the one we're still using today, Treflin, uh, we're still using it today and finding it, finding it yeah, very satisfactory and, and we haven't totally thrown our hose away but we don't, we don't wear as many of them out. Uh, then and yeah, the, from, from going from pulling the peanuts by hand back in the 50s and early 60s, we all have machines now to pull the peanuts and rake them. And the same goes for thrashing. In those early days, when we pulled by hand, the peanuts were all stooped and carted to a stationary thrasher. Uh, and then we, we've moved on to bagging. Everything was bagged back in those days. Then we had, had pick-up thrashers, and you'd, you'd have about three of you on the thrasher one fella on the tractor and those on the thrasher would be bagging and sowing. It was all done then and uh, that's how it was done then and then uh, yeah that, that was up into about the 70s, late 60s, 70s there was a bit of change and then we've moved from there all into bulk, into all bulk and now going from the days when you had stationary thrashers and, and uh, you used to have to cart the stooks to the thrasher, you'd probably have a team of about eight to ten men. And today, all that same work can be done by one man. Yeah, by one man. You know, it probably, probably works hard in a good, good year. But one man and g g generally two, no more than two, to do, to do all that same harvest today. So, uh, yeah, so we put some people out of work. We do work a bit harder ourselves. <laughs> I'd like to be 40 again and going back to the changes that we've seen in the industry in the last few years with the new varieties and this new equipment and the technology that comes with some of this new new equipment. Uh, I, I think it's an exciting time for any, any, any young growers. You know, as I say, I'd, I'd, like, to be, I'd like to be 35 or 40 again. And, have everything available that's, that's here at the moment. At Natramin I uh, broadcast it on with the spread of probably six, six weeks before anticipated planting time. Uh, it's usually just how it fits into the pattern but it's all, always always six weeks to two weeks before before planting. Just once a year I do that. Soil tests every couple of years I do I do soil tests to see where it is going. Sometimes I do that to put the lime to see if I need lime for the calcium for the peanuts, the good uses of calcium, uh, mainly for that, but also just to see where the trace elements are going to and 
Oh, I've probably got, I'd have to say, oh, I've got at least 40 years of soil, soil tests there. I've got the, the original one I did right up to the last one I did. I've got them all there and you, you can look at it and you, you can just see the soil is not deteriorating. It, it, it is improving. It, it improved over over those times, yeah. Yeah, I know when we did our first, first soil test back in the 70s, it would have been. Yeah, probably the late 70s, probably when I did my first soil tests. And uh, yeah, you look at them and you shake your head now and think, I wonder how I ever grew anything on it. But uh, just kept going along and following what seemed to be advised or what looked look a sensible way to go. And yeah, we're, 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 so, soil's much, much better now. Uh, what, what advice would I give a young fella? Oh, be, be prepared to have your setbacks, you know. Droughts will be your setbacks, I don't know what else, but you'll always have droughts. And, and when you have your good year, you just want to try and put a little bit of money away. But when you have the bad year, uh, that don't, I wouldn't say rush at it like a bull at a gate, you know, you've got to feel, feel your way into it. And if, if, if you're sensible, yeah, yeah they'll, they'll be, yeah, it'll, it'll be positive for you. The weather, I'd say over, the last 25 to, certainly 25 to 30 years. Uh, I don't know whether, it, uh, it's some sort of climate change. The seasons, seasons are later. We seem to be planting later, we're getting our frosts later. Uh, everything seems to be, I, I reckon, two to three weeks later than where it was 30 years ago. You know, and there's other growers around say the same thing, you know. It's, yeah, it, it, it's quite, quite quite obvious. You know, it's quite obvious to any, anyone that's been farming long enough can say, yeah, there is some sort of climate change, whether it's man-made or not. I, I don't know, but yeah, there's change there. If I was going to tell somebody from the city to come here, uh, it, it's a lifestyle. It's it's enjoyable, and you have a lot of contacts with your neighbours and other people in the industry. You know, we don't just we, we talk to one another. Uh, we, we just don't do something, isolate ourselves and do something. We have quite a lot of contact with other farmers. You know, we, you could say we probably check up on other farmers or they ring and they'll, they'll check on you. We've had, we've had, had, had four daughters. We bought four daughters up, all went through university. So, you know, the farm hasn't, We've, we've managed to do that and survive, even though my wife had to, she didn't, she went back teaching when the kids started going to university, you know, because most of the time we had two, two at uni at the one time. Uh, we're in that situation, we got no, no government assistance, it was all, all from ourselves. But we had, we had girls mainly come up, city girls come up to the farm, you know, daughters would bring their friends home, sometimes three at a time. And I absolutely loved the farm. They do everything. They'd never driven cars or anything. We had an old car here on the farm. They all learnt to drive. That. They drove tractors. They drove trucks. They climbed ladders uh, into silos. And uh, some some terrific girls. And they, they just loved it. I, I said they never knew there was life like this outside Brisbane. They'd, they'd never never been further west than Brisbane, uh, than Ipswich, and. Some of them I know had never been further north than Caboolture in their life. And to come, come, come out here was, yeah, it was just, just so strange for them, but they absolutely loved it. And they still talk, still talk to my daughters about it today, today you know, and that's, that's got to be 20, that's probably 20 years back, and they still say what a wonderful time it was. If you're not exposed to it, you don't know about it. I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah, I, I know there was a couple of lads came up for one of the girls' 21st birthday. There was a, a couple of car loads of boys and heaps of girls, and they just, they, they never knew anything was like this. The boys had never been, some of them could, couldn't believe just driving up the Black Butt Range. They'd never been there. What a marvellous drive it was, you know, have, have these. And out here they could make noise, they could do what they liked, and with, with no one to upset, and they couldn't couldn't get over how quiet it was. And I know some of them commented on the amount of birds that were here, couldn't, couldn't get over. Yeah, just 
how lovely it is to come out here and see the different birds.